It's the late 1970s and the Canadian province of Quebec is under siege. The Hell's Angels and their rivals the Outlaws are engaged in a bloody gang war for control of the province's lucrative drug trade. Hundreds of people, including scores of innocent civilians, become casualties, and both sides of the war become infamous for the sadistic and vicious methods they employ. When the dust finally settles, 23 members of the outlaws lay dead, with 18 of these murders being committed astonishingly by just one man. This was the work of Yves Apache Trudeau, the Hells Angels ace assassin and a man described as having no conscience and no respect for human life. He would kill his victims by any means available, including shootings, beatings, stabbings, and strangulation. One time he even scalped a victim, which earned him the nickname Apache. But Trudeau's preferred method of execution would be explosives, as he was a renowned demolitions expert. It didn't matter if the victim's wife, children, or anyone else was there. If you got involved or could be a witness, he'd take you out without a single hesitation. But the life of an outlaw biker is one filled with deceit and treachery, as despite all of the work he did for the Hells Angels, Trudeau would eventually find himself betrayed by his former brothers, and only thanks to his cunning and paranoia would he just barely escape a shocking massacre. The story of Apache Trudeau begins in Quebec during a period known as the Great Darkness. From 1936 to 1960, Quebec was governed by the ultra-conservative National Union Party. Imposing its strict Catholic and traditionalist views on the province, the National Union Party ruled with an iron fist until they were defeated in the 1960 election by the Quebec Liberals. The Liberals brought in sweeping reforms that quickly changed Quebec from being one of the most conservative areas in North America to one of the most liberal. With social norms quickly changing, many young people in Quebec adopted a culture of hedonism, with the rates of teenage pregnancies and drug usage quickly exploding and far surpassing those of the rest of Canada. Outlaw motorcycle clubs also became a very popular way for young men to rebel against conformism, and by 1968, there were over 350 outlaw motorcycle gangs in Quebec alone. This many gangs fighting over the same territory led the murder rate in Quebec to skyrocket, with a crime journalist at the time noting, quote, There's always been more violence in Quebec. In the biker world, it's known as the Red Zone. I remember an outlaw's hitman telling me he was scared of going to Montreal. It was in this environment that a 22-year-old Yves Trudeau joined the Popeyes Moto Club. The Popeyes were based in Montreal and were engaged in a myriad of criminal activities which included racketeering, loan sharking, drug dealing, and carrying out contract killings on behalf of the powerful Montreal Mafia. The Popeyes were the second largest biker gang in Canada and had a reputation for violence and depravity, which caught the attention of the Hells Angels who were looking to expand their operations into Canada. But the Hells Angels weren't the only gang looking to move north, as their rivals, the Outlaws Motorcycle Club, also had their eyes north of the border. The Outlaws partnered with Satan's Choice, an Ontario-based gang who were the largest biker gang in Canada. With support from the Outlaws, Satan's Choice expanded into Montreal, which put them in direct competition with the Popeyes. This eventually boiled over into a conflict that would become the first major outlaw motorcycle club gang war in Canada's history. The Satan's Choice Popeyes War would last just two years and would result in the deaths of over 20 people. Both sides received significant support from their American benefactors, with the conflict being little more than a proxy war between the outlaws and the angels. During this time, Trudeau established himself as the Popeye's chief assassin and murdered many Satan's Choice members. The war would eventually end in a stalemate, as both sides suffered heavy losses and were significantly damaged by harsh police crackdowns. With many key members now behind bars, including their leader, 
Satan's Choice agreed to officially join the Outlaws in July 1977. Five months later, the Hells Angels managed to convince the Popeyes to become the first chapter of the Hells Angels in Canada, with Trudeau becoming a founding member. Almost immediately, tensions started heating up between the two rivals once again, as fights would break out whenever members from each gang happened to see each other. This all culminated in an incident on February 17, 1978, when two members of the Outlaws, who were dressed in full gang colors, entered into a bar that was known to be protected by the Hells Angels. The two men sat at the bar drinking until they were forcefully ejected by a group of angels. As the outlaws stood outside shouting obscenities at the angels outside of the bar, a car driven by Trudeau drived up right beside the outlaws and opened fire. Trudeau managed to kill one of the outlaw members and wound the other. This incident was the spark that officially started what is now known as the First Biker War with many targeted killings and bombings happening immediately after. Just one month after the war started, Trudeau managed to assassinate the president of the outlaws in Montreal by planting a bomb underneath his car. A couple of months later, he killed another leader in the outlaws by knocking on his door and shooting him in the head when he answered. During the next couple of months, several key members of the outlaws were murdered with the only Hells Angels casualty being one member who suffered a slightly grazed arm as the result of a botched drive-by shooting. Morale amongst the outlaws quickly plummeted, which convinced high-ranking outlaws member Roxy Dutemple that his gang needed to land a knockout blow if they were to stay in the fight. On October 12th, 1978, National President of Hells Angels Canada, Yves Bateau, met with Walter Stadnick, the leader of an Ontario-based gang known as the Wild Ones. Bouteau had hoped to convince Stadnick and his gang to join the Angels, thus giving them a foothold in Ontario and opening up a new front in the war. The meeting took place in a bar, but was interrupted when two members of the Outlaws opened fire with a pistol and a sawed-off shotgun. One Hells Angels member and two Wild Ones were killed, while two other Angels were seriously injured, but both Stadnik and Buteau managed to escape unharmed. Buteau learned that Dutemple was behind the attack, and so he ordered Trudeau to assassinate Dutemple, telling him it was his number one priority. A month later, Trudeau saw a man walking down the street who he thought resembled Roxy Dutemple. Trudeau approached the man and in French asked, Are you Roxy? When the man did not reply, Trudeau shot him in the back of the head at point-blank range. The next day, Trudeau read the newspaper and learned that the man he had killed was not Dutemple, but was in fact a German tourist named William Weichold, who had no involvement in organized crime, and did not respond to Trudeau because he didn't understand French. Trudeau would later recall laughing hysterically when he found out this news, with his only disappointment being that the Angels would not pay him for the killing as he had requested. Trudeau argued that people who look like Dutemple should be killed too just in case it was him, but the Angels did not agree and chose not to pay him. Four months later, Trudeau managed to kill the real Dutemple by assassinating him with a car bomb. Buteau then began hearing rumors that a local gang known as the Huns were planning on joining the Outlaws, and so he dispatched Trudeau to assassinate the Huns leader which he did by knocking on his door and shooting him in the head when he answered. Trudeau would go on to kill several more high-ranking members of the Outlaws, and was held in such high esteem by Buteau that he tasked him with opening up a new Hells Angels chapter in Laval, a city north of Montreal. The Laval chapter quickly became infamous for their members' violent behavior as well as their flaunting of club rules, frequent arrests, and flagrant drug usage, with Trudeau becoming heavily addicted to cocaine, one time going through over $60,000 worth of coke in just three months. But despite his addiction, Trudeau was known throughout all of Montreal as the best hitman in the city. His attention to detail and meticulous nature ensured that he was always both successful and discreet in his missions, which is why in 1982, Buteau would task him with an extremely sensitive assignment, 
The Hells Angels' most important allies in Montreal were the West End Gang, an Irish-Canadian group who controlled the Port of Montreal, which allowed them to import large quantities of drugs into the city fairly easily. The West End Gang were run by Frank Ryan, who in January 1982 approached the Angels and told them of a shocking plot. Ryan claimed that two Hells Angels members had been conspiring to kidnap his children so Ryan would forgive the coke money they owed him. Ryan was furious when he found out and told the Angels that they either immediately take care of the two members or lose access to all of the drugs the West End Gang brought in. Buteau recognized that time was of the essence as he needed to eliminate the two members before they carried out their plot. But he also needed to be discreet, as if the rest of the Angels found out that he was ordering his own men to be murdered, it could provoke a full-scale mutiny. And so Trudeau was given the task. Trudeau then invited the two men out to a bar for drinks, and after getting them both drunk, he drove them to a secluded spot before shooting them both in the head and dumping them in the St. Lawrence River. Now, despite these setbacks, the war against the outlaws was going heavily in favor of the Angels, as the outlaws seemed unable to effectively respond to the Angels' onslaught. But that changed when in 1983, Buteau was ambushed outside of a restaurant. As Buteau was smoking a cigarette, a member of the outlaws opened fire with a 38 caliber handgun, hitting him twice in the chest, killing him instantly. Buteau's funeral would take place later that year, and involved over 150 members of the Hells Angels from Canada, the United States, and Europe. A day after the funeral, a young boy discovered a camouflaged bomb that had been planted on the path of the funeral procession. Police found that the bomb had malfunctioned and believed that had been likely planted by the outlaws. Buteau's death, however, did not change the tide of war in favor of the outlaws, as later that year, the Angels would be successful in assassinating the new president of the Montreal chapter of the outlaws as well as two of his top lieutenants. By mid-1984, the Angels had dealt significant damage to the Outlaws, who then pulled out of Quebec altogether and retreated to their Ontario stronghold, leaving the Angels victorious and in sole control of the Quebec drug trade. But even with the war over, Trudeau didn't lack for work, as in late 1984, he was contacted by the new leader of the West End Gang, a man named Alan the Weasel Ross. The previous leader, Frank Ryan, had recently been betrayed and murdered by four members of his own gang, and Ross wanted revenge. Ross learned that the murderers had been overheard bragging about what they had done, and so he contacted Trudeau to take them out. In what would go on to become his most famous kill, Trudeau learned that the four killers were hiding out in a downtown Montreal apartment building that was mainly used as student housing for Concordia University. The four men knew they were being hunted, and so they rarely left, so Trudeau devised a plan. He had an associate of his show up to the apartment bearing gifts of a TV, VCR, and a video cassette tape of Hell's Angels Forever, a propaganda film made by the group's Manhattan chapter. Trudeau then detonated a bomb that he had secretly hidden inside the TV. The bomb blew the four men in the apartment to pieces and badly damaged the apartments of eight neighbors. Now despite being victorious in the first biker war over the outlaws, internal strife was close to tearing the angels apart. The Laval chapter had developed a nasty reputation as out-of-control drug addicts, and many in the southern Montreal chapter believed that they were making the gang look bad, a sentiment echoed by New Hells Angels Canada President Michel Langlois. Under Buteau's leadership, the Laval chapter had been prohibited from using drugs, a rule that many members, including Trudeau, regularly broke. But when Buteau was replaced by Laurent Vio, who himself was an alcoholic and cocaine addict, the Laval chapter's problems quickly spun out of control. They would routinely use drugs that were meant to be sold on the streets themselves as well as embezzle profits. They would also frequently be arrested by police for minor offenses, which threatened to put the whole Hells Angels operation in Quebec at risk. The Angels weren't the only ones who thought that the Laval chapter had to be reined in. 
as the West End gang as well as the Rizzuto crime family had also been pressuring them to bring the Laval chapter under control. Soon angels from across Canada were demanding that something be done about the Laval chapter. Peter Carroll, the president of the Halifax chapter, even personally went to Montreal to meet with Réjean Lessard, the leader of the southern Montreal chapter. During their meeting, Carroll demanded that action be taken against the Laval chapter, and to his surprise, Lessard agreed with him and spent much of the meeting ranting about how they were quote, a menace and a threat to the existence of the Hells Angels in Quebec. Also attending the meeting was George's Bow Boy, the president of the Hells Angels Sherbrooke chapter. Eventually the three agreed that swift action needed to be taken and the Laval chapter had to be liquidated. In March 1985, a secret meeting was called where the Laval chapter was declared to be in quote, bad standing, meaning they were to be killed. Lossar, Carol, and Bowboy devised a plan where the Laval chapter would be invited to a party at the Sherbrooke chapter clubhouse that would be attended by both of the Montreal chapters as well as the Sherbrooke and Halifax chapters. The three also planned out the fate of each member of the Laval chapter. Two would be forced into retirement, another two would be given the opportunity to join the southern Montreal chapter, and the rest would be killed. Carol and Lassar wanted Trudeau in particular dead, who they regarded as a dangerous and out of control drug addict. Despite attendance at the party being mandatory, Trudeau sensed that something wasn't right, and so the week before the party, he booked himself into a drug detox facility in Oka, Quebec. The rest of the Laval chapter attended the party, where they were ambushed by Lassar, who with 41 angels under his command forced the Laval chapter into a small room in the clubhouse where they were all shot and killed. This event would go on to become known as the Lennoxville Massacre, and it disgusted many in the criminal underworld. Most importantly, a man by the name of Salvatore Cazetta, who believed that the massacre was an unforgivable breach of the outlaw code, and so instead of joining the Angels like he had been planning to, he instead formed his own gang, which he named the Rock Machine, which just nine years later would challenge the Hells Angels for control of Quebec, leading to a conflict known as the Quebec Biker War, which almost destroyed the Angels and would become the bloodiest biker gang war in history. Trudeau remained unaware of what had transpired until a representative from the Montreal chapter arrived. The representative informed him that he was kicked out of the gang and was now a marked man unless he killed the one other member of the Laval chapter who had avoided the massacre, a man named Jean-Marc Donager, the gang's chief accountant. Trudeau tracked him down in March 1985 and strangled him to death, leaving his body in the trunk of a car on an abandoned city street. The next month, Trudeau was arrested on a weapons charge and sentenced to one year in prison. While there, Trudeau learned that he was still a marked man, as even though the Montreal chapter had agreed to let him back into the gang in exchange for killing Donager, Trudeau heard rumors that the Angels had placed a $50,000 contract on his head and were trying to arrange his death in prison. Out of options, Trudeau turned and became a police informant and government witness. He agreed to testify against his former brothers in exchange for a cushy cell and reduced sentence. Testimony delivered by Trudeau would directly lead to the imprisonment of 39 Hells Angels, which included many senior members. Hells Angels Canada President Michel Langlois was among the implicated, which caused him to flee Canada for Morocco to avoid arrest. This would lead to a power vacuum in the Hells Angels leadership that would eventually be filled by a ruthless and ambitious man named Maurice Boucher, who would go on to become the new leader of the Hells Angels in Quebec and lead them in the Quebec Biker War. As part of his plea deal, Trudeau also helped police resolve 90 unsolved murders. Now while an informant helping police solve so many crimes is usually a good thing, this time it put the government in an awkward position. As out of the 90 murders Trudeau helped police solve, he was the murderer in 43 of them. In addition, he also admitted to being involved in 29 shootings, 10 bombings, 3 beatings, and 1 strangulation. He also admitted to 15 attempted murders. Detectives deduced that out of 43 murders, 33 were of rival gangsters. 
meaning the remaining 10 were innocent civilians. Trudeau and the government eventually worked out a deal where Trudeau would plead guilty to 43 counts of manslaughter, and in exchange he was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole in just 7 years. Under the terms of the deal, Trudeau was also given a luxurious cell and would be paid $40,000 over the next 4 years, in addition to $35 every week for cigarettes. The deal caused considerable outrage with the public, as many felt that the deal ensured that Trudeau's victims would never receive justice, and it was indicative of a lazy and incompetent justice system. But despite this, Trudeau was released from prison after serving just 9 years, where he was given a new identity and moved to Valleyfield in southwest Quebec. Trudeau worked as an orderly in a nursing home and also drove a bus for the handicapped. Trudeau then entered into a relationship with a woman who did not know anything about his past and lived a relatively quiet life until the year 2000, when he was laid off from his job. Trudeau then gradually slid back into his cocaine addiction, and in 2004, he was arrested once again for the rape of a 14-year-old boy, for which he was sentenced to just four years in prison. But because he was still on probation from his previous sentence, he was automatically resentenced to life in prison. During his trial, the judge remarked, quote, In your lifetime, you have killed more people than the entire Canadian military did in the Gulf War. As he was now a convicted pedophile as well as a known police informant, Trudeau was kept in solitary confinement 23 hours a day for his own protection. In 2006, Trudeau was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer and was described at the time as quote, a skeleton of a man who needed a wheelchair to get around and spoke in a weak, raspy voice. Yves Trudeau died two years later at the age of 62. The sister of one of his victims remarked on the news by saying, quote, Killing to him was like buying a bag of milk. A guy like that doesn't have a soul. That cancer is justice. And that was the video. Thank you for watching, and if you have a suggestion on a future video, please leave it in the comments below. Thank you, and I will see you next time.